What is up, Level Up Nation, and welcome to the Thursday, July 15th edition of Level Up Live, your home for gaming and esports news, brought to you by OTN Media. My name is Fiasco, you can call me John, and I am joined once again by my buddy, uh, you know him as the Courtside King, Joey. What's up, buddy? I am doing well, guys. This is my first time back into the actual office, like outside OTN stuff this week. Uh, so that's been a little crazy, as you guys know. We are in the Washington, D.C. area. The Metro is such a fun thing to adventure out on every morning and every evening. Uh, so it's been interesting. It has been quite the experience this week getting used to a new schedule. Who doesn't love riding the Metro? Every form of mass transit is perfect. It is not flawed. It does not come with delays. It is 100% beautiful. And that goes true here in the D.C. area. Uh, and if you are not able to tell, that is extreme sarcasm. Uh, what is not sarcasm is what I'm going to ask you to do next, and that's to make sure you are following the show on social media. You can follow Level Up Live on Twitter and Facebook at Level Up Live. That is at LVLUP Live. And while you're on Twitter, make sure to give your favorite or least favorite uh, gaming esport host a follow. That's Joey at Courtside King, myself at Fiasco. Uh, we would appreciate that as well. And Nation, the show is available on a podcast version called Level Up Podcast. It's available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, if you didn't know. And if you are listening to the podcast version, we have one favor to ask you. That is, of course, leave us a rating and a review if your platform allows it to. Uh, that feedback does go directly back to us, and we then take what you guys want into consideration and make those changes here to the show to make the show what you, our listeners and viewers, want the most. Uh, so please do provide that awesome feedback. All right, Joey, uh, it's Thursday. The weekend's right around the corner. What are some of the topics we're talking about today? John, we have a lot of topics. So first, before we jump into this, let's just revisit the whole new level up thing here. So for the most part, the format is staying the same for now. And the big change is that we are getting rid of that Monday. That is now Game on DC, kind of like a podcast focused on the local gaming and esports scene here in the DMV area. Level up will be just Thursdays. So you're looking at a little bit of a longer episode. I think we typically run about 60 to 90 minutes on Monday and Thursday, so this will be around a 90-minute episode for Thursdays. Uh, so we're cramming in a lot. We're going to have to cut a lot as well just to keep it within that time range, but we're bringing a lot of gaming and esports news to you guys this week. I hope everyone ate dinner beforehand because we're going to be here a while. Uh, Joey, you know what goes <laughs> great with dinner? A beverage. Uh, it is time for the drink of choice. Uh, what in the world are we drinking today? What, what are you sipping on? I am drinking what Waterboy recommended, some high-quality H2O. Uh, oh. I just had time to refill my water bottle and barely make it here by 8 o'clock. So we, we got things rolling, but it's water tonight. Solid. Um, I will, I'll bring the heat then. Uh, we're breaking out the copper mug again. We're going with a Moscow Mule. It is not a hibiscus version. It is just your standard Moscow Mule. Uh, some awesome vodka and ginger beer in there. Uh, tasty. Tasty. Probably not nutritious, but it's okay. It's fine. Uh, Joey. It's a long show. Let's not delay it anymore. Let's get right into it. Let's get right into our first segment of gaming and esports news. Let's go. Absolutely. We're going to kick it off with some roster moves. Let's talk League of Legends. CLG thinks it's Tanner time, John. They're going to bring in DeMonte to get the job done in mid lane this weekend. Uh, DeMonte previously played for 100 Thieves for a little while. Uh, he's a good mid laner. He's been tossed around between quite a few teams here and there. I don't really know the reasoning. I mean, he's not the top tier of mid laners, but he's also far from the bottom tier. I put him right in the mid of the mid lane, to be honest. Um, but overall, the guy gets the job done. He's able to come in. He's able to mesh in multiple teams, as we've seen with, I feel like, three or four organizations over the last couple of years. Now he's over on CLG. CLG looking toward the bottom of the table right now. They have a pretty good jungler over there in Broxa. Top lane is not bad with Finn. It just seems like that team needs a piece to fit in to kind of make them better than what they currently are. Uh, CLG's hoping that piece is going to be tan or putting DeMonte into that mid. We'll see if that ends up getting the job done for them this weekend. Overall, I like the move. If you're the bottom of the table, you obviously want to do something. If you're making some improvements week over week, that's great. But how can you get up from the bottom, up from the, the basement, really, of the standings? One way is roster moves, and this could be the one. Yeah, I actually really like this move. I think it's a smart move by CLG. Uh, definitely not living up to their name. It's not counter logic at all. Um, I, I think it's a very, very smart move. Like you said, DeMonte's not a bad player. 
Uh, he's not a great, he's not an elite player, but he's definitely not a bad player. I, I think overall, this might be the roster change needed to help CLG kind of rebound. They really haven't been the same CLG uh, that if you followed the scene for such a long time, uh, CLG the past three, four years, slowly going downhill. Uh, they're losing out on all the roster acquisitions to other big name organizations that might be able to spend a little bit more, more money uh, on players uh, than CLG is able to do so. Uh, DeMonte has a very big fan base. Uh, they'll be bringing, they'll be coming with them to CLG. I think this could be a move to, to rejuvenate this roster uh, for CLG's League of Legends team. Uh, it may not be enough to really make them competitive once again and, and like, like really earn their way back into the LCS. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. So Tanner time this weekend. We'll see if it works out for CLG with that roster move. Moving forward with Sigma the League of Legends, we have T1 over in the LCK of South Korea. They have terminated the contracts of coaches Danny and Zepha. Uh, they're still aiming to finish strong is what they're coming out with their PR statement saying that they still want to earn a bid to Worlds, as does every team, including CLG at the bottom of the table of the LCS. Uh, will it happen? That's a question mark out there, but they do have Faker on that squad. They do have a lot of legacy on that squad, a lot of talent on that squad as well. So it is a possibility, but one way that they're going to try to move forward with it, instead of making direct roster changes, they're going to change out some of the coaches. They're pretty much saying, as T1 is the organization, guys, you have so much talent. This roster is beyond stacked. This The backups for some of these players could probably be one of the best teams in the LCS, and they're still not quite where they need to be in terms of that bid for Worlds. So what are they going to do? They're going to change out the coaches. I think this could be a good move. It comes at an awkward time. It's kind of the end of the season. It's one of those kind of last minute, like, let's try our best to get there by eliminating these coaches now. Do I think it gets them there? Again, I think it's more going to be the talent than the coaches that might get them there, if anything. Uh, just Faker being on that team can be a big X factor when it comes down to the stretch. Um, but overall, John, I think coaching changes can be a big benefit for teams. Uh, this one just, it, it might be too little too late coming in. Yeah, so when a team struggles, an organization will do one of two things. They'll either do a massive roster overhaul, uh, which usually takes place in the offseason or in between splits, um, or if they need a more immediate uh, effect to the team, they'll change front office, they'll change coaches, they'll change management, they'll figure out a way to shake things up. Uh, it's very typical in esports. It's very typical in, in traditional sports as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot out still whether you know does a coaching change really make a big difference if the performance on the rift or on the field if we're talking traditional sports um is the big issue maybe it might be a different uh a different uh team chemistry afterwards maybe the morale might change maybe that might be enough to get people going the right direction uh, we are an organization like t1 when you have that history behind you, when you have that expectation, when you have a, a fan base that demands excellency every step of the way, and you're not able to do that, you have to make changes. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to see the, the coaches go, uh, but it's T1. It's a business. Uh, they are in the business to win, and this is what they feel is a step in the right direction for them in trying to right the ship. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. You got to change a factor, or you just go with what you have and have a very good chance of missing out on worlds, or you can change one of those factors, whether it be a player on the roster, a coach, whatever, to try to make that final push by making the X factor in a sense, or maybe potentially eliminating a factor that's been negative. Uh, in the end, they decided the two coaches were the way to go, at least for the elimination factors. Uh, we'll see what that ends up doing as they continue the rest of the season and look for that bid for worlds. Last but not least, into acquisitions this week. This one moving from player rosters to organizations. Toronto-based esports and entertainment company Overactive Media has commenced trading on the Canadian TSX Venture Exchange. That's the TSXV for those looking at tickers. And they'll be under the ticker of OAM on that exchange. Overall, I don't think we have to touch too, too much on this, John. But it's yet another esport company or esport organization going public. We've seen quite a few over the last couple of years. A number of them over in Europe. We've also seen a couple, like Fnatic didn't necessarily list on a stock exchange, but they opened it up to bidders to give some of that ownership away in a different way. Uh, so we've seen this in a couple different instances, whether it be direct listings or in other ways like that that Fnatic did. Uh, in the end, I could see this being a good move. I still think the biggest issue with esports right now, at least in terms of investments, is no one really knows exactly what its net worth is. We see some clubs like 100 Thieves, 
FaZe Clan who have jumped into other things as far as like merchandising, uh, lifestyle branding with a, apparel. We've seen stuff like Fanatic where they've jumped into actual gear, like Fanatic gear for peripherals. So a few different companies are looking into different angles and that's potentially made them more worth on the bigger market. Uh, this is one that we necessarily haven't seen jump into too many different angles with their esport teams in general, um, but they are a bigger media company overall with Overactive Media now listing on that stock exchange. We'll see what other factors they can bring to the table now with the public having some mind and hands into it as well. Stonks going to the moon. Diamond hands, hands baby. <laughs> oh, Anything else to say there on our friends up in Toronto? Is it illegal for Americans to invest into uh, the Canadian stock market? Uh, if that's a serious question, I actually have no idea. I would think there's probably a possibility of doing that. Joey, you're you're the guy that made the financial tweet. So, you know, it's it's one of those things oh where I, I come to you for financial advice now since, since you went semi-viral. Uh, so. I, I actually, I, yeah, I don't know. I would think we can. Like, I'm invested into <laughs> Chinese markets and Japanese <gasps> markets and stuff. So I would think we could do that here. I mean, Canada's just up north, right? Sure. Up north. Canada. Just want to let you guys know, we like the stock, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, we are. We are not an investment podcast. Bye, you bye, guys bye. Take sell, your sell, money sell. with your own risk. Um, but if you guys are interested in some kind of esports investment, Overactive Media is now listing again on the Canadian TSX Venture Exchange. Ooh, this next bit of news is Gucci, John, if I say the least. Uh, 100 Thieves and Gucci are partnering up for an apparel drop. This one is dropping on July 19th, just a little bit later this month. Uh, John, we really don't have much in terms of teasers for this one yet. We have a 100 Thieves logo, a little X, some Gucci action, but nothing really in terms of what we're looking at apparel-wise outside of a little video that might give some hints. Joey, I'm, I'm going to say it again. I, while I love the fact that designer uh, apparel clothing lines are paying attention to esports, I just feel like these kinds of deals really miss the mark with the average fan. This is definitely geared... To the older fans that have that disposable income uh, that are willing to pay for five hundred dollars for a t-shirt, that are willing to pay five, six, seven hundred dollars for a belt, one belt, just one, uh, that are willing to pay eight, nine hundred upwards of a thousand dollars for a pair of shoes. If you fall in that category, this is for you. A hundred thieves and Gucci, a hundred thieves is great. Uh, they, they're a great uh, eSport organization. They're a great lifestyle brand. Don't get me wrong. Teaming up with Gucci is, is, is incredible. But at the same time, I cannot get excited about this because, you know, I, I would consider myself an average eSports fan, maybe a little above average. Uh, to me, it just, I have no interest in this. Like, and, and I know I can't be the only one. Like, if you're a 16, 17-year-old eSport fan, are you going to go up to mom and dad for your birthday and be like, oh, I want the 100 Thieves uh, Gucci uh, you know, line of, of clothing apparel. I want one T-shirt. And they're like, oh, sweet, one T-shirt. How bad can that be? $400. How about that? <laughs> uh, mom and dad ain't buying you a $400 damn T-shirt. It's going to fall apart the first time you watch it. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I, I get it. I, I, I understand the deal. I know why 100 Thieves did it. I just feel like these deals just completely miss the mark when it comes to reading the esports scene. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different facets with this deal. And just to break down a couple of them, you touched on some good ones there. Uh, if anyone's going to do a deal like this, I think it's 100 Thieves or FaZe Clan. They're the two that can really make a deal like this work because they're known as a lifestyle brand as well. Now, with that being said, it goes back to that target audience like you were talking about, John. A lot of these audiences are younger. Now, with that being said, I have seen people drop thousands of dollars on 100 Thieves gear, thousands of dollars on FaZe Clan gear. So if anyone is going to do it, again, I think it is these two orgs. Now, on the grander scheme of things, when we're looking at bringing legitimacy on a bigger grand scale to esports, a brand like Gucci, a brand like Ralph Lauren, a brand like... Um, I don't know, it was Rolex or something did one too. But some of these big luxury brands can help bring that name out onto a bigger stage. Now, do we really care if fashion models and all these big people are into esports? I mean, potentially, because those could be future investors for different organizations. Um, but in the end, your average fan, as you were saying, I don't think is going to be that interested in something like a Gucci partnership, even with it being 100 Thieves. Now, I, there are going to be people who buy it. It is going to sell out very quickly. 
With that being said, I think it's going to be limited stock. So that is why it's going to sell out quickly. And it's not going to be for that average fan. <laughs> so I'm not opposed to it. I, I don't think it's going to be the greatest deal, but I'm kind of a little bit more in the positive that I think it does help bring some more awareness on a global scale and maybe eventually bring some more money into the scene because of it. Sticking with partnerships for one more in a slew of Space Jam-inspired gaming partnerships over the last couple of weeks, the latest sees LeBron James dropping into Fortnite as an icon skin. He's going to have three outfit variations if you want to pull those up, John. We got a nice little Toon Squad basketball uniform. Then we have him wearing a shirt with tacos and a little bit of a do-rag working. And then the final one, which is my favorite, is him in a black hoodie, some nice gold lion-ish looking shoulder pads, and a nice crown. Oh, this yeah, movie. shake that head, shake that head. <laughs> this movie's going to be so bad. Yeah, I am not interested at all in this movie. Like, okay, cool. LeBron, you got in Fortnite. Congratulations. Uh, someone named Ninja did it first. Um, I, I, I think it would be different <laughs> if I was actually hyped about the new Space Jam movie. I think it would be different if I actually, you know, liked watching LeBron bounce from team to team, making his decision and, and all the other fun stuff and where he's going to take his talents to next. Um, but, you know, other than that, I mean, I, I mean, cool. Awesome. Great. I, Fortnite's still stupid popular. A lot of people still play it. You know, there's a lot of pro athletes that play. I think a lot of people are going to be really hyped about this. The skins do look good. Don't get me wrong. They look great. Um, but again, it's just, uh, I don't know. I just, I can't get hype about, maybe, maybe I'm just so jaded because I think the original Space Jam with Michael Jordan was was that good that there's no way they're going to be able to, to, to pull off this sequel or redo or whatever in the world we want to call it. Uh, Joy, I'm just happy to say I don't have to pay money for it. I'm going to be able to stream it tomorrow and I'm not going to have to go to a movie theater uh, or anything like that. I don't even know if I want to stream it tomorrow. Maybe if I'm really bored one day, I'll watch it, you know, maybe a couple months down the road. But What are you going to um, stream it on? Uh, it's available, I think, on HBO Max for free. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, you pay for HBO Max, but. Right, right, you know. right, right. Wow. Hooray. Okay, Space Jam. So, John, <laughs> member of the Toon Squad in real life and in Fortnite. Toon Squad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. It's definitely, in my humble opinion, not going to touch the original either. But if you're a Fortnite fan, now you have another icon skin to choose from. With a little bit of an NBA flair plus some Disney action as well. Okay, let's see. Next up in the news, John EA is in the news. Go figure. Shocker. Would you like to start with the bad news or the good news for EA I'm fans sorry. slash players? <laughs> you said it was EA. Is there such thing as good news? There's some new information, let's say. You Maybe know, not good, but intriguing at least. Let, let's do this then. Let's go ahead and try to go with the good news because I doubt it's good news. And then... When we come to the conclusion that it's not good news and it's bad news, then the bad news won't sting as much because we're already prepared because it's bad news. Okay, good news first it is. So, Battlefield 2042, we've seen a lot. We got a trailer in early June. We had another trailer during the Microsoft or Xbox Bethesda showcase at E3. Then we've had a couple more information drops here and there. Now we got a big one via EA Answers. These are questions that the community has been asking. EA actually answering the community here uh some very detailed answers coming out as well dropping in a lot of battlefield information so we're going to break a little bit of that down the whole article is giant so we're not going to break it all down for you you can head over to answers.ea.com and find it under the battlefield section over there it's a big thread by the developers so it should be pretty easy to find uh, but they answer a ton of questions give a lot of insight into the new game and we'll break down a couple pieces of that starting with cross progression and cross play this has been something people have been asking for in EA games for such a long time. We finally got it in Apex Legends. They're looking at adding it into a couple others. We haven't heard it quite yet for stuff like FIFA and Madden and all those games, but it does look like Battlefield will be making the move to support cross-progression and cross-play. For cross-play, it's going to be PC, plus your new next new current next-gen Xbox consoles, uh, the Xbox Series X and S, as well as the PS5. And then the Xbox One and PS4 will also be cross-play with each other, but not with those newer consoles and PC. So that's a big win, in my opinion, and that's kind of an EA good, the fact that we are seeing them finally make more steps toward cross-progression. Yeah, uh, cross-progression, cross-platform, cross-anything is always a good thing. Um, you know, as everyone knows, I recently made the switch over to Xbox, and one of the big games I like to play 
MLB The Show. Uh, the fact that MLB The Show has that cross-platform play, the ability to, uh, I could start the game on PlayStation 4, my old PlayStation 4, and essentially port everything over to my Xbox account was great. Uh, cross-platform, cross-compatibility, cross-everything, cross-progression is absolutely fantastic. Uh, really, really happy to hear that EA uh, is going to feature this, uh, at least for Battlefield 2042. Uh, will that be uh, something that they carry on in FIFA? Will that be something they carry on in Madden? Uh, will that be something that they carry on in their other titles? You know what? I'm not going to go out on a limb and say yes. I'm not going to go out. And I, I will probably say they, they. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Not unless the people uh, that have the rights uh, or that are licensing the rights to EA really put up a fit. Kind of like what we saw, uh, as Joey has mentioned here before, Major League Baseball uh, kind of really being the force behind moving MLB The Show to Xbox as well. I really don't see that happening unless... Uh, like a, a, a FIFA or the regional leagues come out and really force EA's hand. I hope you're wrong, but I have a feeling you're right. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm right there it's with one you. of those things that I'm just, yeah, I agree. I think they're going to have to be forced by like your NFL. I don't even know who would force it with FIFA. I guess FIFA just overall would be the one, but someone to kind of force that license. Uh, it just, it feels like EA continues to put it off when it's something we've seen them integrate into other games like Apex for a couple years now. Uh, it's been there in the ecosystem. We've seen Fortnite have it for, what, three years at this point? Like, it is something that's not super uncommon anymore. Yeah, we don't have it in sports games. So hopefully one day we will eventually see EA continue to make that move. But for now, it will be coming to Battlefield. Uh, a couple other things in here that stood out, John. So how do customized loadouts work? Uh, guys, I honestly have not played a ton of Battlefield, but this sounds like a big positive change. to me class weapons to the person welcome back <laughs> hey did you see my dance or is that all off it, it was very quick I, I wasn't yeah it was yeah it was, it was oh, fun. i'm sorry so, sorry guys good. i'll dance again soon um yeah i figured i froze you always make a funny face when i freeze i'm like oh that's I'm my have to wait cue. a little while yeah it's my, it's my visual <laughs> cue to you is <laughs> I like it. I hope Chad enjoys it as well. Uh, so I don't know what you guys heard, but this to me, again, not a big Battlefield player previously, but I do like the sound of this change. So your loadouts classes will no longer restrict what weapons you can use per loadout. So if John wants to be a support with a big LMG, he's more than welcome to. If he wants to be an assault with, I don't know, he can carry a hammer around. Sure, go for it. He can be some kind of melee class with it. So your primary weapon, your equipment, secondary weapon, and throwable will all be switchable regardless of which class you start out in. Uh, I really love this idea, John. I think this is a big change for the franchise, and I think it's going to be a great one moving forward. Yeah, it, it should be great, and hopefully it's a start of a trend with EA uh, here going in the right direction, being more gamer-friendly. Absolutely. So to give you guys a little bit more insight... It jumps into specialties. It talks about traits for the sake of time because we have so much to cover tonight. We're not going to dive into all of that, um, but it's definitely worth looking into if you're interested in a battlefield. They also talk a little bit about the maps. They go a bit more into what you can expect as far as kind of the natural disasters go and how they'll change the maps as they occur. Um, I'm trying to see what else we got. We got skyscrapers. Can you fight on every floor of sky skyscrapers? You will not be able to play on every level of the skyscraper, but you can't expect to lobby and rooftop combat. Uh, they talk a little bit about map sizes and how that's going to differ pretending on the potential player count per area. The vehicles is going to differ as well. Again, those bigger maps that have that 50v50 or whatever it ends up being, depending on the console that you're playing on or the platform, rather, uh, you're going to have different vehicles appear in those different maps. So there's tons of stuff, guys. Seriously, we could go on for days on this, um, but definitely worth looking into. On top of that, there will be a technical test that happens later this summer. So you have some cool technical tests coming out. You have Halo Infinite is going to be later this summer. You have Battlefield later this summer. I don't know if Call of Duty will do one, but I think we'll hear about the new Call of Duty sooner than later. I would guess at Gamescom in August. Uh, so lots of different potential tech tests for you guys to play in as well. My throat is already hurting. This is going to be a fun night, fam. Okay, a copy of Super Mario 64. Can I hear all the boomers in chat? Uh, this was released in 1996. It just sold for $1.5 million. Mm. That is the most ever paid for a video game. 
The previous record holder was a copy of The Legend of Zelda that went for $870,000 at auction. Uh, John, I don't know about you, but I paid, I think, like $60 for my copy. Uh, I have $1.5 million for a copy of Super Mario 64 from 1996. That is insane. I think that game when it came out, it was twenty nine ninety nine. Like sixty N sixty four games, like were thirty bucks, um, and they've just gone up in price over the years. They have, they have. <laughs> and if you're a PlayStation five holder, congratulations, you're paying seventy dollars while everyone else is still paying sixty. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's Joey. I'm I'm gonna go into my storage unit and uh, see if I still have my copy of Mario sixty four. Probably not in mint condition. I've definitely played it a little bit here and there. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Am, am I a millionaire and I just don't know it right, right now? Like, I, I feel like I need to go check. Yeah, it's crazy. I still have my copy too, but it is definitely not in mint condition. Uh, this one was unplayed in an unwrapped box. It rated at an A++, it looks like, from mm. w, WATA, maybe? I can't quite read this sideways. My head tilt is not good enough. Uh, but it got a 9.8 rating as well from the people who ended up reviewing it as far as looking at the mint condition of the collectible. Again, ended up selling for a crisp $1.5 million, almost doubling the record that The Legend of Zelda sold for at $870,000 in an auction previously. So congrats to that owner, the new owner of the game, as well as the new owner of that $1.5 million. Mm. <laughs> Taxes, man. Taxes. People pay crazy things. Uh, this next one we're not going to touch on too much, but I do want to mention it for our good friend Panicking Pat and those other RTS fans out there. Sega and Relic have revealed Company of Heroes. The nice sequel of Company of Heroes 2 is now Company of Heroes 3. This one is set to launch in 2022 with a nice crisp trailer you guys can check out at companyofheroes.com. Sliding into a bigger topic, John, this one can be on your streaming radar. Netflix has hired Mike Verdu, the former EA executive that oversaw Command & Conquer and Medal of Honor, plus most recently developed first-party VR games for Oculus. Netflix is looking to launch their own games into their subscription service, potentially arguing their own place as the Netflix of gaming, which people have kind of given the title to Microsoft's Game Pass at the moment. But Netflix says, no, no, we're going to be the Netflix of everything. So they're coming in with Codename Shark. Uh, that is the new name of this potential video game service. They're looking at some potential third-party deals. There's some rumors about Sony being one of those. Uh, in the coding of the iOS Netflix app, someone found an image of Ghost of Tsushima as well as an image of a DualSense controller uh, in that coding of the iOS app. Now, that could just be someone messing around. Uh, it could be someone actually finding some things. You never know with these posts that come out. Uh, this one did come from a semi-reliable source. It wasn't Reset Era or one of those, um, but it is definitely something to take with a grain of salt as we get closer. We do know that Sony was trying to work on some kind of Game Pass competitor. Maybe they just threw the towel in and said, hey, Netflix has thousands upon thousands of subscribers already. Why don't we just align with them? It gives us a big install base. It allows us to jump into this new service that people are going to be hyped about. Uh, this could be a big, big win for Sony, in my humble opinion, if this ends up being true. Uh, with that being said... Uh, after Google Stadia and after Amazon Luna, I am a little bit hesitant for someone else to jump into the space that already is kind of a big tech giant. Why not, Joey? Are, are you nervous? Are, are, are you jaded by the history of failure from these big tech companies trying to do this? Because <laughs> uh, if you are, you have every right to, to, to be so. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could say I'm excited, but I, I expect failure. Yeah, I'm just nervous. I feel like Netflix has done a good job with game like adaptations from video games to tv shows so that is somewhat of a positive i could see here um but overall I, i'm more curious about the first party stuff their little n plus game logo thing that they're going to end up putting on these netflix originals and some of their shows have been pretty solid for netflix originals um but how does that translate over to video games i think that to me is the biggest question mark i think aligning with sony would be great for both sides it gives sony in a sense another way to push their games out there they don't necessarily have to fund a Game Pass competitor and lose money up front like Microsoft potentially was at the beginning. Uh, on top of that, you jump into Netflix subscriber base, which is already worldwide. So I think it could be a big win for both sides if that part does end up being true. Up next is Europe's biggest gaming event, and that is Gamescom. Gamescom, rather, uh, has awoken from its slumber with new details announced. Gamescom is when they announced Donkey Kong. Uh, will take place August 25th through the 27th. The main theme, John, is games, the new normal. Uh, it's going to focus on games for society, more games for less money, and live streaming is what they came out and said from their PR release. So we'll see exactly what that ends up meaning. 
Uh, I really don't 100% know what that's going to all translate to. Uh, I think Gamescom is pretty good, though. It's one of those things. It's not quite E3 level of showcases. You don't get tons and tons of big reveals, but there are still a solid number of reveals that come out here. Uh, I, I don't know if it happened last year, but the one beforehand did have a bunch of Gears of War 5 stuff that ended up pulling in millions of views. So there are some bigger games that are announced here. It's not necessarily your biggest games, uh, but who knows this year? You have quite a few people coming in on the list of people that will be attending. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, taking a look here at their website real quick. 100% digital and 100% free. Uh, that's always a good thing. They're not going to charge you to watch. Uh, so that's uh, two thumbs up in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think it's great. I'm glad it's back. Uh, can't wait to see what new titles uh, are going to be announced from a lot of the studios that we're used to seeing at these kinds of events. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it'll be great. Super excited for it. And I did not pull up the list ahead of time of all these partners. So you guys can join me going over to twitter.com forward slash OTN media to find that list that I tweeted out this morning over there. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and scroll on through here and list some of these off. So we have 505 games. You have Activision. Activision being there to me makes me think we're going to see something Call of Duty related, whether it is the official reveal of Call of Duty World War II Vanguard. You didn't hear it here, folks. Uh, or something else, maybe a little bit of gameplay if they show a CGI trailer beforehand. I don't quite know, um, but Activision will be there in some way or another. You also have Diablo 4 that might be able to be shown. They didn't put Blizzard on here specifically, so I think it's going to be Call of Duty, though. You have Aerosoft, Assemble Entertainment, Astragon Entertainment, Bandai Namco, they just launched Scarlet Nexus, and maybe they have something else to show us as well. Bethesda listed on here, so that means you could get some kind of death loop stuff coming in. It would have just launched at that point. Uh, maybe Ghostwire Tokyo, maybe a couple other surprises. Uh, there are rumors of a potential Quake reboot. We have rumors of Wolfenstein 3 and a couple other things that people have not mentioned as of yet. Then you have Electronic Arts coming here as well. So EA has already said at their EA Play Live in July, they're not going to show any Star Wars content and they're not going to show anything Bioware. So none of your Mass Effect Dragon Age. This could be a spot to fit one of those titles in here at Gamescom. Moving forward, a couple more. We have Game Evil Come to Us Europe. Uh, they're most known for mobile games, so maybe you get some nice mobile game action from them. Head up, Indie Arena Booth, Coke Media returning after a stint at E3. Next Studios over there with Tencent Games. Sega Europe. Sega Europe has a lot to announce. I don't know if it'll all come out here, but there's some good stuff happening with Persona and that franchise. Uh, they have a couple other things with like Company of Heroes that we just mentioned earlier in the show being announced. That could come out there as well. Team 17, a number of cool indie games. This next one I'm excited for, Thunderful Group. Uh, they are pretty much the people, it's a new name for them. I can't remember their old name, but they're the people who make the indie game The Gunk, which is on my list of ones to look out for this year. So definitely uh, could see that here at Gamescom. You have Ubisoft. They just showed off Avatar and that Rainbow Six. I don't remember the name. Quarantine, Extraction, Infection, Parasite. They've changed it so many times. Uh, <laughs> Rainbow Six, some kind of nasty infection that ends up becoming very bad. Uh, game that green. game or Avatar, maybe we see something <laughs> of one of those two. Uh, you have War Gaming and last but not least, Xbox. Uh, the big thing to mention here with Xbox, I think, is the fact that you do see Bethesda and Xbox listed separately. That, to me, means you're going to get something from Bethesda's publishing arm as well as something from Xbox's publishing arm. Um, I mean, that could be Redfall gameplay. I think they should have gameplay ready to show for that. It could be a first look at, um, I think it's Compulsion Games' new game. In Exile has another game they haven't shown. Obsidian has two or three games. So you never know what could come out there. I would love to see something like Avowed. I think it might be too early, but we might get a reveal of a new project there as well. That's Gamescom, fam. John is a big fan of Gamescom, not because there's some awesome games shown. He is that as well, but he's also got that good little German action working on over there, and Gamescom brings a lot of that. Uh, per people like me who cannot read German have a very hard time working their way around certain parts of the website uh, that Google Translate does not like to translate. So somehow we pulled it all together and we were able to bring that news today. Okay, enough of me making fun of myself. Next up is GDC 2021. John, this, uh, back to making fun of myself. I don't understand half the stuff that goes on at this event. Uh, it's very much developer focused. Someone like me who likes to just hop onto a game, get some achievements here and there, have a good time looking at graphical environments. Uh, this is something that's not necessarily for me to deep dive into, but there is some really cool stuff being shown here that I think is...
is worth highlighting. The first thing that a lot of people are bringing up is the time of the sponge. For those listening on the podcast, I should be unfrozen here soon. You're good. <laughs> it's it's okay, inside to, to, to virtually poke your box to see if I can get you restarted. <laughs> there you go. See, this is why you guys should watch live on Twitch. You know what's happening as opposed <laughs> to this awkward time on the podcast recording. <laughs> anyway, GDC, the Games Developer Conference, John. One of the things that a lot of people are looking forward to is the Coalition, most known for the Gears of War series. They're going to be publicly debuting Alpha Point, which will be one of the first tech demos outside of Epic Games that we will see in the Unreal Engine, uh, the new Unreal Engine 5, that is. Uh, TC is pretty much the Xbox Game Studios expert using the Unreal Engine. So they're going to come out, show this new demo, Alpha Point, on the Xbox Series X and S at GDC next week. The presentation is going to run approximately one hour long on Tuesday, July 20th starting at 1.20 p.m., and I don't have the time zone on that. If I had to guess, it is probably Pacific time, uh, but we'll go ahead and look that one up for you guys later on. That's going to be Tuesday, July 20th. Put on your calendars for now. Other than that, John, I know you have the website up here. There are quite a few panels. I don't think we need to hit all of them, um, but there's some cool stuff in here. They talk about how Minecraft ported Realms to Azure uh, over from, I believe it was on the Amazon service previously. They talk a little bit about cloud gaming, uh, there was one in here that made me think of you, John. It was with audio. Uh-oh. Uh, the Audio Summit, Moving the Needle, Inclusive Audio Production Practices, and Tell Me Why, I think sounds really cool. Uh, they why, talk about CFBs. Why did that Go make ahead. you think of me, just out of curiosity? Uh, one for music and audio, and two for Tell Me Why. It kind of hit two checkboxes <laughs> okay, right fair, there. Okay, that's fair, that's fair, that's <laughs> fair. Hey, you know, no, Moving the Needle made me think of you. <laughs> I mean, hey, I mean, I, I had to ask. I didn't know, you know, it's... <laughs> no, it was definitely the music as well as the Tell Me Why Just game because I know you're a big out, fan. <laughs> I know, I know. So lots of cool panels, guys. Again, this is targeted toward developers, so it's not going to be for a casual gamer to jump into. But if you're interested in checking it out, that is on the radar for next week. I believe the first day is July 20th. Continuing on, I th we'll just touch on this briefly. There's some new Xbox features headed to the Xbox Family Settings app. Uh, parents can now set spending limits as well as view and accounts balance. And then children can now request to buy if their funds are low. Just a nice little quality of life change coming to that app as they continue to develop it and try to be a family-based console. Uh, Nintendo is now currently the big console out there that has that family sticker on it. Uh, Xbox has made a lot of strides in that area, though, trying to get better and better, as is PlayStation. Uh, in the end, I think this app, and I know, John, you've used the app before uh, for your nephew to help your sister out. I, I think it's a really great app. I personally haven't used it myself, but the UI looks clean from what I've seen. And I think adding more and more abilities to it is just going to make it a cleaner experience for families. Yeah, and I remember I messaged Joey as soon as this news came out about this this redesigned app, or this added feature, I should say, and about how now when uh, the kid's wallet uh, on his account is out of money, it can <laughs> request funds. And I'm sitting just going, like, knowing my nephew... He's probably going to be, like, requesting money, like, every three minutes when the money runs out. And I can just imagine my sister sitting at her office, uh, her phone blowing up, like, every 30 seconds with requests of money from my nephew. And I just, I'm just like, I was like, you know what? It seems like a good idea. But at the same time, I can see this backfiring like crazy. Uh, no, overall, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, I, I think it's better than leaving a credit card set up on your kid's account. And then letting them charge a specific amount a month that can easily go over because they're not paying attention uh, versus uh, a, a system where you put money onto the account. Once it's out, then they have to requ uh, request money. If it's a $20 game and they only have $19 in the account, they have to request that extra dollar. Uh, I think it's 100% smart for them to do. I think parents, uh, it's a great way to... Uh, make sure your kids being safe online, making sure that they're not spending a ton of money also. Uh, because it, it's kind of funny, Joey, a, a couple of our OTN members uh, have recently uh, hit 18 uh, years of age and they are starting to realize how expensive things are like car payments or car insurance or even going to the grocery store. Uh, you know, small things like that, that like a 13, 14, 15 year old really doesn't worry about because they don't have to worry about it. Uh, so it, it's kind of nice from an adult perspective, these changes to that app going forward. Absolutely. And I like the idea of like positive incentives as well. So like if a child ends up getting good grades at school, or maybe the child is like perfect on getting their chores done for the week or whatever, the parent can also go in there and add without being requested. 
So whoever ended up doing their stuff can go ahead and get an extra $20 or whatever to buy toward a game or maybe $60 if they did really well. Uh, obviously, that's going to differ family to family. Um, but in the end, I think it allows for some of that incentive as well as built in more communication between parent and child. Did you ever get paid for grades, Joey? No, I did not. I definitely didn't. <laughs> I got told to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure, if job. I, pretty sure if I got paid for grades, I would owe my parents money. Um, Cause my, my, <laughs> my grades a couple year in high school were not exactly the greatest. I'll go ahead and throw that out there. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> wow. The reverse payment payment yeah. plan. It's like, be... I owe you money now because they were so bad. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we just went there chat. You gotta love it. Uh, the next thing <laughs> on the radar guys is the X screen. By the way, I love this naming. Uh, why can't we do this naming? Apple does it so well with iPhone and iPad and all that good stuff. Why didn't Xbox go this direction with the Xs? I don't know. I think it works well with this community-made product, though. The X screen is a fold-out display that can pretty much turn an Xbox Series S into a portable gaming machine, and it just launched on Kickstarter recently. So how's it doing, John? Uh, it's doing quite well, if you want to go ahead and pull this one up. Uh, it ended up going over its budget, I think, like, I want to say it was like 300% or something on the first day. Uh, they have currently raised $99,000, almost at $100,000, after their original goal was just shy of ten dollars at $9,700. It has 611 backers already and still 21 of its 30 days to go. Okay. This is not an original idea. Um, this was around during the PlayStation 2 era. They had a travel screen that would connect to the back of your PlayStation uh, if you needed to play your PlayStation while you were traveling. Now, let's think about that. The PlayStation 2 is not exactly a small console. Uh, it's roughly a little bit bigger than the current Xbox Series S. Uh, and I think a little bit taller, too. Um, it would connect onto your PlayStation 2. You would power the PlayStation through your cigarette outlet. That, that That's what that 12-volt outlet is in the car. That used to be for cigarettes, people. Um and, and you would play, and you would have the screen hooked up and be drawing power from your PlayStation. And the idea of it's cool, the idea that you can take your PlayStation 2 with you in your car on a family road trip and still play uh, was a great idea. I think people underestimate how small these screens really are, uh, it, which makes things a little difficult from time to time. Uh, but I, I love the idea that this is coming back. Uh, I, I still think... At the end of the day, mobile gaming and, hand, and hand, uh, handheld uh, portable gaming units are better uh, than lugging around a, a you know Series S in your car. Uh, but these are also great, like if you're doing uh, you know like an old school LAN party. Like, like, let's say you're you're playing over at your friend's house, and uh, you know you all bring your Xboxes over, and you have these, and you know and and God forbid Timmy's mom and dad don't have 15 TVs that you guys can use to plug your Xbox Series S in, you have this mini portable uh, screen that you can plug into the back of it, and boom, you're good to go. Um, I, I like the idea. I, I'm I'm actually kind of shocked that's kind of making a comeback, but but kudos uh, to, to, to the team behind this in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I, I think it's really great and obviously has a lot of backers because I feel like it hits a market that has kind of been overlooked by a lot of these, these console developers. Yeah, I had the PS2 one. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a little bit of a hassle to travel around with. And I think you hit on some of the big differences here. One, the Xbox Series S is so freaking powerful for its size. And like to get something this size now, like can you imagine transporting like an Xbox One or a PS4 or a freaking PS5 that's like the size of a refrigerator? Uh, all that stuff would be so hard to transfer around. So the fact that the Series S is so small kind of makes it more viable. I like that this has the speakers built in. I don't remember. I think the the speakers on the PS2 one were not very good, if I remember correctly. They were so bad. So I don't know the quality of these, but maybe they could be better. I like that this is foldable. I don't think the PS2 one was foldable, if I remember correctly. Um, I think this makes it a little bit easier to transfer with that being the case. So overall, I like it. Is it something I'm going to go out and buy? Probably not. Like you said, John, I'm going to lean toward like a Nintendo Switch or even like something like xCloud or even a mobile game on most of those trips at this point. But it is something that could be reliable for, like you said, a LAN party. Or maybe if you have multiple people in a car and you want to have them play together or whatever, then yes, it becomes a little bit more viable in that sense. And I think for a LAN party, something like this, I think of all those esports tournaments we did pre-COVID, something like this would be perfect for events like that. 
Okay, Joey. So I, I have great news here for you. I have found an image of what this horrific PlayStation 2 version of this product looked like. <laughs> um, it doesn't fold, does it? It was like straight up, if I remember it correctly. It does fold. I don't think it closes, but it does. F um, why is the picture not loading now? I need. I don't the know. I see it's like the, this nice like skyscraper. The got whole going purpose on over of there. this thing here. Hold on. Uh, hold on, me. Get this set up here. We were going so good, chat, and now we have entered Boomer Hour, where John oh. and I talk about old PS2 screens that attach for travel. <laughs> Just so it does look like it does look like it originally folded down. At least this model did, but this thing is, I mean, a PlayStation 2 again is, is a thick boy to begin with. You have to remember this was back in the days of memory cards to save your game. Uh, you had this massively thick screen that went on the back of it with crappy speakers. Uh, built-in headphone jacks and everything else, which made it kind of cool when you traveled. But, like, look how small that screen is. It's ridiculous. I, I don't know. I just, yeah, anywho. I don't think that's the one I had. I think I had a different one. Um, but shout-out to Squirkle in chat, The Fold Station. I love that the name. Fold Station. That, that's awesome. I like that. That's good. The Fold Station, too. Ah, uh, yeah. Good old, good old memories of those car travel trips where you had... I don't know about you, John, but I used to have mine, like, bungee-corded between, like, the middle console... I think is what we did with it. You 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 could afford bungee cords. Oh my gosh! Don't even start with me. <laughs> I swear. Uh, so if you guys want to play your fold stations, maybe you can find one at auction for one point five million dollars, like Mario sixty four from ninety six. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on to more recent news as we move into a new handheld device. Oh, uh, this no. one you can buy with the screen attached to it directly. Uh, what are you saying? <laughs> so so Squirkle wanted to know if we showed the one for GameCube. I forgot Game uh, GameCube actually had oh. one. This thing is ridiculous. Uh, hold on a second, I'll, I'll pull it up because I feel like it, that one wasn't terrible, was it? Oh, it's. Oh. You you tell me, Joey. You tell me if if that's terrible or not. I mean, you already know how small the GameCube is. Oh, I, mean, I remember. It's this literally thing. the size of the PS2 mobile screen on a GameCube. I mean. And then you got the cigarette outlet charger cable and everything else to go with it. Oh, that is. Uh, why are these a thing? I just, I. Oh, that's the GameCube controller with the added like yeah. rumble pack to it too, I believe. Rumble packs. Remember when you had to have a separate accessory to make your controller rumble, Joey? And it was either that or a memory card on your N64. Did you want to save your game or did you want to have a good experience while playing your game? Take your pick. Wow, we have gone so far <laughs> down is, the boomer hole this tonight. Rabbit holes just keep spiraling. Yeah, so the N64, bad. you had like that plug in rumble pack and then it didn't even like go over the course of the controller. It was literally just that rumble in the top like portion of the controller. And it made uh, the controller so awkward. Time. Like it was so top heavy. Like it was like it was super heavy. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> oh my god. This is this is incredible. This is not a tangent I thought we'd be going on in this episode. No, we just we folded this one in just like the fold station two over there. The GameCube screen and all of this goodness. Uh we're gonna go to modern day though, John. We'll probably make our way back to boomer times here Please soon. <laughs> uh, but going a little bit to modern day with a new handheld device, we have Valve announcing the Steam Deck today. This was formerly, we've talked about it on the show a couple months ago. This was the Steam Pal, for those that remember us talking about that on the show. Uh, same thing, they ended up going with Steam Deck in the end. It's a powerful, portable gaming PC handheld starting at $399. A somewhat competitive price there compared to some of the stuff on the market at the moment. Uh, this is kind of new in its own way, though. So go ahead and pull that one up for us. Let's take a good look. It is designed by Valve and powered by Steam. On top of that, they did give us a release date, which is something that has been hard to come by here in 2021. They are shipping December 2021 with reservations going online tomorrow. Uh, podcast listeners, you might not listen to this before they go live, but it will be tomorrow, June 16th, uh, for those that do hear that live on the show tonight. Uh, if you want to check these out, so some of the options coming out as well, John. They have a $399 option for 64 gigabytes, as well as a couple other things we're going to dive into here a bit later. 529 gives you 256 gigabytes, and then 649 gets you the big kahuna of 512 gigabytes. Uh, my concern, and we can dive more into the specs here, but just based on gigabytes alone here, is so many of these games are so big at this point. Now, Call of Duty is not available on Steam, so that might not necessarily jump into your gigabytes here. But if you have like Modern Warfare and Warzone both enabled, 
that's like 200 gigs right there. You're talking about one game, and this is, biggest is 512. And I think 512 is prior to those system settings being on there as well. So it's going to be even lower in the end. I, look, I, I don't understand how this is going to work. Uh, are they going to allow for, you know, uh, you know, separate storage? Like, can I plug, a, you know, via USB-C cable? Because I think I saw a USB-C on, uh, port on there uh, to a hard to like an, a, to an external hard drive. Um, am I going to be able to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, 512 gigs is nothing. You know, re rewind the, the clock back 15 years. Yes, 512 gigs is massive. Uh, but nowadays, not in the days where, you know, my computer alone has like five terabytes in it. Uh, it just it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and plus, on top of it, the pricing. I, like, we have to talk about the pricing here. Yes, you get the Steam library on it too, but you're you're gonna have to pay for those games also. So you're paying on the on the low end four hundred dollars just for the unit itself. Then everything else on top of it, all the games and everything else you want to put on it, and how the fact that you're only gonna have like two or three games on it because you're only paying the three hundred dollar version, and that's two or three indie games that are maybe eight, nine, ten gigs big, uh, and, and that's about it. Why would you not get a Nintendo Switch? Like, I, I, to me, I just don't understand. Like, yes, you're involved in the Steam ecosystem, and, and, and that's great. But again, storage being an issue, like, it to me, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, if you're going to be a direct competitor with Nintendo, uh, and Nintendo is the is the S-plus tier of mobile, of, well, portable gaming, I should say. We'll leave phones out of it. Uh it, to me, I, I just don't see how this is going to really challenge Nintendo unless they they bank on a big deal coming down uh, later in the road. Uh, but again, you know, let's say hypothetically, let's you know, let's say uh, Game Pass comes to come, come to this unit also. That's great, congratulations. Now you want to download, uh, you know, what? Wait, EA, EA's in uh, Game Pass now too. Let's say you want to download FIFA. That's 50 gigs. Congratulations. Uh, with the operating system, I'm pretty sure the 399 model is already done, dead and done for. 529 is your next one at 556 gigs. Congratulations. You are now paying more than a next gen home console for a portable unit uh, that you might be able to store now eight or nine games on it, uh, including the operating system. Maybe, depending upon the size there too. So you have to pay for the big kahuna. That doubles that. 512 gigabytes for almost 700 freaking dollars. Uh, to me, it, it, the pricing doesn't make sense. The unit looks great other than some button placement. Uh, the unit looks great. I just don't see how this is going to be a direct ch uh, uh, challenger to the Switch. Even with the new Switch coming out, I still think that's a better deal. I don't think the new Switch is a good deal, but I think in general, the Switch has such a big market share. And this is the big thing, even if you look at cloud gaming as well. You look at someone like Xbox who comes in with this giant catalog already versus someone like a Amazon or a Google, and they're struggling to find time in that space, even getting to that space before Microsoft did in terms of gaming because they already brought in all that portfolio. So I think what Steam is looking at here is saying, hey, all of you guys have these giant Steam libraries. You always talk about how many things are already backed up into your library and you just can't get to. Now we have a way for you to get to them on the go. This is for your parents who are going to soccer games. This is for your people who travel a lot. This is for people who commute into the city. So I think it's going to have a place out there. But again, there are some big issues I have. One of the biggest ones being storage. We've talked about it even with the Series S, John, when I was looking at a Series S or a Series X, your biggest thing was what about the storage? It's so much smaller are you going to be able to fit all these games without buying an external hard drive? For me, it's worked out really well because I play a ton of indie games. But for the normal gamer, if you're into like Warzone, for example, like we mentioned previously, that's almost half or like a third of the Series S hard drive right there for Warzone. So depending what you play, and that goes for the same thing here, if you're downloading like PUBG or I'm trying to think what are the other big ones that Steam has. I don't even know, like because Call of Duty's not on there. Rainbow Six is probably pretty big. Um, so there's a number of them out there. You guys can go look through your libraries and find out. Um, but in the end, that's one of the biggest question marks is how are you going to fit the space in here? And if you don't have enough space, how much are you going to invest into hard drives for the USB-C port? Or I think they have a micro SD slot as well. And that's not going to hold a ton either. Uh, and then you have the Nintendo Switch, who has been the best-selling console 
even with the Xbox Series S and X and the PS5 coming out. Now, you can argue shortages here, shortages there, but Nintendo's had shortages as well. In the end, the Switch has been the best-selling console for like 22, 24 months or something in a row in most countries. So it is just insanely outselling everything at the moment. So it has a giant market already. Not to mention, we just talked about a Mario game that went for $1.4 million and it's from 96. Uh, this is one thing that you don't see with any other companies. PlayStation and Xbox. More years that your game is out, the price goes down and you find it in bargain bins. Nintendo, you can have a game from 92 and it'll go up there and be worth three to four times its value, if not more, depending on what the game is and what conditions it in. So Nintendo just, it goes to the beat of its own drum. And I think that is going to be Steam's biggest competition here. The device looks great. I think it's awesome to have a mobile PC. I think the storage is an issue and I think the button place is button placement is questionable uh, and we'll dive a little bit more into that but overall i think the switch like you said john has just such a giant market share right now that it's gonna be tough for steam to bite into i, I do have to ask this question you see these like are those speakers on the back or are those uh uh air vents like are, are we gonna get like a whole ps5 like jet engine cooling system coming out i think that's i think, I think the speakers. one at the top has got to be air vents I don't know, but the, to I me, think the speakers just, are on the front, actually, John. I okay, think that so, bottom front might be the speakers. Okay, so so then the one on the back Those might be air vents. Yeah, if they are, that is that's some pretty beefy air vents for a mobile device. That would be hot to touch too, potentially. Yeah, you, you you hit you hit the R four button and you just like burn yourself. You're like, oh, it's, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's dive into the specs, my dear tech analyst over here. Uh, we have custom APU developed by AMD, some Zen 2 plus RDNA 2. We have full-size controls, as you guys can see with that awkward placement they decided on. A 7-inch screen, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth ready. I think that's a big plus. They ended up going USB-C for accessories. I think that's a plus as well. The micro SD slot is available for extra storage if you want it. And there will be a dock similar to Nintendo Switch that will give you the capability of connecting it to other displays, whether it be a monitor, a TV, etc., as well as wired networking for the internet. Confirmed it is a fan. It is a fan. Are you a fan of the fan? No. I, TBD. I, this is absolutely ridiculous. I just... I... I I don't know. Like, I think the most unique aspect of this is the fact that it has a touchpad or two touchpads on it. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. Um, I like the USB-C uh, display port 1.4. Okay, cool. Supports uh, 8K up to 60 hertz, 4K to 120 hertz. I get it. I like it. It makes sense. It's a powerful, powerful beast. Uh, eight hours of gameplay. On the battery, I guarantee you, you're playing a graphic-intensive game that gets cut in half. Uh, you know, I'm not going to really knock it. You know, the Switch has a bad battery lifespan. Also, uh, I don't know. Like, I want to be excited about this. I really do. I, I think the unit again overall looks great. The spec-wise, it's a very powerful uh, mobile gaming device. It spec-wise, it definitely challenges the Switch 100. percent uh, that's not where the question comes down to. You're like little Timmy is not going to sit here and look at the specs and, be, and like go up to mom and dad and try to justify why Santa needs to bring him a stream deck or a Steam deck, not a stream deck. I knew I was going to make that mistake as soon as I saw that. I know. Name, I don't like the whole. Yeah, they went way too common on that name there as well. It's like I literally looked at name that name I was like, doesn't Elgato already have that like as a trademark? And I was like, oh, it's a Steam deck, Steam. Uh, yeah, but like, can you imagine like little Timmy going to his parents and trying to pitch this idea on why mom and dad or Santa Claus needs to spend almost seven hundred dollars for literally? I feel like that's only the viable. That's the only viable option, and even then, the price point makes it completely unviable. Um, to have the five hundred twelve gigabyte storage when you can get a switch for a fraction of the price and just continue to do what Nintendo has done so well. Since the uh, since the initial Game Boy launched, uh, all the way back in the '80s, like I just to me, this is a very niche product um, that I I feel like is going to have the same problem every other company that enters the mobile gaming market, not cell phone, just mobile gaming in general, has uh, going up against Nintendo. It's that you can't go up against Nintendo because Nintendo's able to drive the price down because they've had such a hold on the market. When you're coming into the market, you have to do something big and great. That drives the price up. 
People aren't going to do that. They're going to stick with what they're familiar with, and that's Nintendo. I, I would like to see the Steam Deck do well. I just, for the price and, and the crappy amount of storage that they give you, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, spec-wise, the Steam Deck is going to blow the Nintendo Switch out of the water. Squirkle in chat makes a good point as far as the exclusives, though. That is something that Nintendo definitely has in its favor. Uh, unless Valve is going to start dropping more Half-Life games, which T-Spans in chat has also teased over on our OTN Discord. Uh, that is discord.me forward slash OTN for those that want to check it out. We can drop that in chat as well. Um, but overall, I think that's one of the biggest things here is those exclusives that Nintendo has. They already have that relationship with families from Mario and Legend of Z or yeah, Legend of Zelda, Metroid, all these games that have been around for so long, so that relationship is already built. Now, Steam has a relationship as well, but it's more for those hardcore gamers, and with this price point, that might be more their target anyway to begin with. My other big thing, so we hit kind of the switch all the way down, I think cloud gaming is another big competitor here. Uh, even if we don't count Google Stadia and Amazon Luna as highly as a lot of people do, I think you also look at just xCloud in general. Microsoft xCloud, if I'm looking at spending the cheapest amount of money and it's not even its full actuation yet because you're going to end up with a some kind of streaming player coming out later on as well. But one of the big things to look at is just you can use your phone. I can literally pull out an iPhone, pull out an Android phone, and play xCloud on it. Now, you can argue latency is not quite there yet, and I think that's going to continue to improve as it moves forward. But eventually, I think these different consoles, if you're not a household name like Nintendo, and again, Steam is a household name but for a different audience, I think it's going to get tougher and tougher for something that says you can use your phone you can buy a controller for $50 to $100, like the Backbone or the Razer Kishi or one of those, and then you buy Game Pass for $15 a month. So for $15 a month plus a $100 purchase of a controller, I can use my phone for this dang thing and have hundreds upon hundreds of games available. So eventually, I think this thing is going to have trouble with cloud, and I think it's at that point now where it's got to sell really well up front or cloud is going to end up getting good enough that this doesn't really become a thing that's going to be big at all. There's a reservation fee, too, if you want to pre-order. In order um, to ensure orderly and fair ordering processes for customers when, Stream Deck, when Steam Deck inventory becomes available, the fee gives us a clear signal of the intent to purchase. I love it. Quirkle in chat, a bunch of kids are going to be getting Stream Decks this Christmas. That's yeah. so real. I mean, a parent is going to see that and just not know the difference at certain points. I guarantee it. It is going to be, they're going to see the one for $100 versus the one for $400 plus, and they're easily going to navigate toward the other one. Yeah, it's going to be one of those, if they do end up buying the Steam Deck for their kid, uh, it's because they are just completely oblivious, and they'll find out like a week later, and then they're going to have to convince little Timmy to give it up and switch over to a Nintendo Switch because mommy and daddy can't afford the credit card bill they put it on. <laughs> Need those parental setting apps. Um, <laughs> I wonder if they'll come uh, out with an app for that too. <laughs> last bit on here, and this is something T Spans mentioned on Discord earlier as well. So Valve is currently working with BattleEye and Easy Anti Cheat for Proton and Steam Deck support. Uh, it is not currently going to be supported. So that's games like Apex Legends, Fortnite, Destiny 2, uh, PUBG, Gears of War. All of those type of games will not be accessible on this device at the moment due to the anti cheat not being supported. Valve has come out and, again, said they are working with those companies to try to get that supported, but at least for now, it will not be built into it. Uh, and it'll be running a Steam OS, so another thing with that means it is a PC. It is not a closed Steam ecosystem. This is not purely you can only use your Steam library. You can use other things as well. You can install Windows if you want to. Uh, I think you can use many different game stores. Supposedly, you can also access Xbox Game Pass on there, so that could be a win. Uh, it's not going to be natively built into Steam like Gabe Newell wanted, at least from the sound of things, um, but it will be one of those things that will be accessible by downloading these other apps and installing Windows. So it could potentially become a Game Pass machine, and that could be a seller for it as well. Okay, sliding from the Steam Deck, not to be confused with the Stream Deck, not to be confused with Half-Life 3, uh, we're going to move on into some other game updates and leaks. The first one coming from Phil Spencer and his interview with Kinda Funny. Uh, he mentioned, and this isn't really a leak, this is more like a fun little thing to play around with. Uh, Phil quotes saying, seeing old games do well on Game Pass absolutely incentivizes reboots. Uh, John, this quote got me very happy. Uh, he goes on to say it gives us more data to think about things that we might pick up and take forward. So my mind's already thinking we have all of these legendary IPs back in there. Uh, Banjo-Kazooie is a good one. Uh, you have Cameo that a lot of people ask for. 
there's just tons and tons of lists, uh, lists of big IPs that are out there. And this to me makes it sound like Xbox is considering some possible reboots and we could eventually get what we've been hoping for in Banjo Kazooie or Banjo 3E. Maybe. Who I'm knows? stoked. Is there any other game you would want to reboot? If you could reboot one game, what would it be? I want to reboot and a remaster of GoldenEye. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. GoldenEye redone with current gen graphics. I think that would be really sick. Um, so see. just to jump on GoldenEye, because that was one that Phil actually mentioned. Xbox and Nintendo and this... I don't know who this other company is, but there's another company that has rights involved into that. And mm. now I guess Amazon does as well with them owning the license. Um, but the whole GoldenEye thing is between all different parties. So they have tried to make a reboot of it. It was originally scheduled to drop on Xbox 360, um, but there are still talks on going. Just I don't think anything's gone forward. Yeah, and I do believe Rare was the, the leading publisher when that first came out. Yeah, Rare yeah. published in a deal with Nintendo. Yeah. And now Amazon owns the rights and someone else owns rights to GoldenEye as well. But I would love to see that remastered and come back out. Uh, the graphics were good at the time. Uh, in today's standards, definitely not. Uh, not even close. Um, but yeah, I would love to see that one. Um, let me think of some other ones I played. Uh, Perfect Dark would be another good one. Um, that one you're getting. That one is being remastered in a uh, sense. Siphon Filter? Oh, no, Siphon Filter was PlayStation 1. Never mind. Um, so, I mean, we could play PlayStation 2. I'm cool with PlayStation. Siphon's cool. Yeah, Siphon Filter was awesome. Um, Metal Gear, you might have something at some point. So th they did. Uh, they did. They they already redid Metal Gear Solid, the original, with PlayStation 3 technology, I believe. Um, and that was great. I mean, look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to redo Metal Gear Solid. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, uh, when you actually go back to Shadow Moses, spoiler alert, if you haven't played that game that came out like eight years ago. Um <laughs> When you go back to Shadow Moses and like you you get dropped off in the forest and like you have to walk and find your way to Shadow Moses and like all of a sudden all the music and the flashbacks and all the flashback audios come in, uh, wow, absolutely amazing. Let's just, just leave it there. Um, I think that would be fun. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many titles I would love to see get get a not a reboot but like a a, a remastered version of it. Chat over here talking about heavy ammo as well. Yeah, I mean, there's just there is a number of games out there totally that could be rebooted, and there's just so many IPs that like Rare especially is just a treasure trove of IPs. If you guys ever played like Rare Replay, I mean, even some of those arcade sound games, if they were to reimagine them into like a 3D version, it, it would just be interesting. There's just so much to dive into back there that I feel like a lot of potentials could eventually leak out of this. Next up is delays. So a couple delays came out today and previously this week. So Ghostwire Tokyo over there by Tango Gameworks. That one has been delayed to early 2022. Uh, that is an Xbox-owned game with that PlayStation agreement prior to the purchase of Bethesda. So in early 2022, it will be launching on PC as well as PlayStation, I believe, 4 and 5. And then from there, a year later, it will launch on Xbox consoles. You have Warhammer 40K Darktide. Uh, that one has unfortunately been delayed for quite a while. It's going to be delayed until spring 2022. And then Lemnus Gate got a slight delay. It was supposed to come out, I believe, early September, late August. It is now delayed until September 29th of this year with a beta dropping next week to help fill some of that time. Chat is popping off over here. Um, okay, next up. Okay, so this one, we got to be a little careful with how we talk about. Um, NetherRealm and TT Games. So there was this deal we talked about a couple weeks ago. AT&T is selling Warner Brother games off. They're spinning it off into a side company. Well, not Warner Brother games in and of itself. It's all Warner Brothers. So everything Warner Brothers is being spun off into a sale into Discovery for this kind of merger deal thing going on. So with that being said, uh, there are rumors. We heard rumors back in August and September of last year that Warner Brother games, uh, AT&T was looking at selling it off. In the end, it got spun into this different thing. Uh, Jez from Windows Central recently came out on the Xbox 2 podcast and mentioned that he saw documents proving that a couple months back they were looking at selling a few studios. Those studios were NetherRealm and TT Games. Uh, and then we recently had someone else come out, the VP of Global Communication from, I believe, Warner Brother Games, that stated that they will be added into the merger with the Warner Discovery deal and they will be included. They're not being sold. I've heard that they're being sold. I heard that they were being sold back in March. So I don't know where things have gone because the Discovery deal got announced after that and it could go into that. 
from what I heard back then was that AT&T was looking at selling the whole thing off, games and the full inclusive, prior to the Discovery stuff. I think it could be sold, but it could be after the Discovery deal concludes. So this statement could technically be true, where it is going to get sold over to Discovery, and then Discovery would be the one that eventually spins it off to a Microsoft or a Disney or a PlayStation or whoever. Um, but I wouldn't sleep on these two games, and the other one that I heard and saw some things on was Rocksteady. So Netherrealm, Rocksteady, and TT Games are the three that are potentially going to be sold off from what I've heard. TT Games is most known for like those Lego games, Lego Indiana Jones, Lego Star Wars, all that good stuff. Speaking of Lego Star Wars, we haven't seen anything new about that game for like a year and a half, which, <laughs> hello, game, where are you? Uh, it's almost like the last movies. People just kind of want to forget about it. Um, Netherrealm, they have Mortal <laughs> Kombat. Um, Mortal Kombat, popular movie that just came out. They obviously have all the games and all the legacy with that series. Uh, the big thing with Netherrealm is that it comes with the IP. They are a very valuable studio right now because when you look at fighting games, Nintendo is not really supporting Super Smash that well. You have a number of other ones like Tekken, Mortal Kombat. Uh, it is a hot commodity to have a fighting studio. This is a big win for a few people. For Sony, they just bought Evo, so it makes sense to have a fighting publisher under their umbrella. For Xbox, they've been looking at someone to publish Killer Instinct. They have a good relationship with NetherRealm as well with some partnerships. So Xbox is another suitor, potentially. Discovery could just hold on to it as well. So there's a couple things there. TT Games, I think one other one to look at is Disney. Uh, a lot of these LEGO games they make are with Disney IPs. Maybe Disney just brings them under their Lucasfilm Games umbrella altogether. Uh, and then Rocksteady, most known for Batman. I think that one could potentially stay under that umbrella. But again, it is a very talented studio. And I would love to see what they could do with that, with something other than the DCIP. Okay, anything else on that? I'm very curious what's going to happen because I, I think with the deal, things could have changed, but I'm not set on believing the statement that they won't be sold at all. Yeah, um, I probably lean to the, the fact that they probably will get sold. Um, I don't know. It, it, it just feels like it's moving in that direction from everything we know. Yeah, I just don't see like a company like Discovery dealing with video games for very long. Yeah. It just doesn't feel like it fits under that umbrella as well. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I could see them having a new home at Xbox. I could see PlayStation. I could see even Disney potentially, though I think they're really enjoying the sit back and license uh, thing they have going on right now. So we'll have to see how all that plays out. Uh, last bit here for some kind of update slash leaky type of things. Destiny 2 players. This one's interesting. Uh, it sounds like you'll be getting a Destiny 2 Halo crossover coming out here later this year. A new rumor suggests that Bungie is working on its 30th anniversary pack for Destiny 2. That is not the 30th anniversary of Destiny. That is the 30th anniversary of Bungie the company. And the pack will include a crossover with Halo as Bungie has a ton of history in Halo for three or four titles over there. The crossover portions will include... According to this data mine leak, you're going to get a heavy sniper rifle, which is going to be an exotic. John, this one I'm stoked about, a gravity hammer. I don't even play Destiny, but I feel like having a gravity hammer in Destiny sounds like a ton of fun. You have the CE Magnum pistol from Combat Evolved, the original Halo game. That also is a legendary. You have battle rifle. I don't know which battle rifle they're going with. It doesn't specify, but that will be a legendary. And then your themed armor sets, the Hunter will be getting the ODST from Halo 3. The Titan will be getting the Reach Spartan uniform, and then the Warlock will get your boy the Arbiter. I don't know if it comes with the Energy Sword, but that is going to be the costume coming over there, as well as two secret missions. Uh, they dive into a bunch of other stuff that's going to be included in the pack that is not Halo-related as well, um, but this will definitely be the big part that drives this pack home. So if you're interested in that, this is what the data miners have come up with so far. All right, show of hands. How many people are going to re-download Destiny 2 because of this? Show of hands. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and put my hand down real quick. Anybody else? No? No one else raising their hands? Cool. Awesome. Destiny 2 is a dead game. Move on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't download it either. If they could not get me to re-download Fortnite for having Master Chief in there, there's no way I download Destiny for this. Uh, I think it's cool, though. I think it's a really cool crossover. It's a great way for Bungie to kind of invest into their current game with some of their history to give that back to some of those players, especially with a lot of those Halo players moving over to play Destiny with that relationship with Bungie already established. So I like it. I think it's fun. I think it'll be cool to look at. Uh, if someone wants to get a gravity hammer and come show it to me in the OTN chat, I'm all about that life. I probably won't be going to grind one myself, though. 
upcoming stuff. We got some PUBG action. They have rolled out a new Tango, a Tango map, uh, two new weapons, and a bunch more in today's update. So if you are looking for some new Battle Royale injection, because we know John is a big Battle Royale fan around here, uh, you can get it on Fortnite or this new PUBG patch as well. Uh... Yeah, give me that smile. That's what I thought. Uh, Pokemon Unite. If you're looking for a new MMO, maybe League of Legends and Dota 2 aren't quite getting it done, you can now pull out your Pokeballs and get it done here. Uh, Pokemon me? Unite will be dropping on Nintendo Switch on July 21st. Uh, it'll also be coming to mobile devices, both Android and iOS, later this summer slash early fall. Uh, I'm intrigued by this one. Pokemon Unite, I believe we saw last year. Um, T-Spins, I don't think it is coming to PC. I do not think this one is coming to PC. John is enjoying the Pokeballs over there. Um, but yeah, Pokemon Unite at least will be coming to Nintendo Switch, and it will also be coming to mobile devices. It's going to be kind of your MMO where you can jump into the body of a Pikachu or a Charmander or whatever you want to over there. I don't know how many Pokemon will be included in the end or how many skills or kits are going to involve. They're really too much about the game, but with it being Pokemon, you know it's going to do well in the end, so it's definitely one worth checking out. You okay over there? Don't you tell me how to handle my Pokeballs. That's, that's all I'm I say. agree, chat. I think the gameplay <laughs> looks interesting. I feel like it is going to be a much more relaxing version of League of Legends. League of Legends is something where you play and you yell at one another. Pokemon is more like, <laughs> try harder next time, Pikachu. Joey, um, you're not supposed I, it's probably gonna to be yell. Toxic. You're, you're, you're <laughs> not supposed to yell in League of Legends. That's just what the community has my evolved ABCs. into. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's be real here. Oh, what a time to be alive. So yes, Pokemon Unite, a new MMO hitting to your Switch, your mobile device, and who knows, maybe it comes to PC as well later on, uh, but that will be July 21st for the Switch players who will get it first. EA Play Live drops next week as well. That's July 22nd for those looking at trying to find some new screenshots of the new FIFA and Madden. Uh, maybe you'll get some other things as well, but it's EA, so you never know. Uh, it's going to be around 40 minutes long. <laughs> New looks are going to be Battlefield 2042, Apex Legends, uh, Lost in Random is also included, plus some other games that they don't really list out. Uh, those are most likely some kind of sports games, knowing EA will find its way in there. Uh, one update we did get today is there will be no Star Wars games included. We also know there will be no Bioware games included, so no Mass Effect, no Dragon Age, no uh, Untitled Fallen Order sequel, um, Battlefront Three is a very far time off, so none of that action. You get Battlefield 2042, you get Apex Legends, Lost in Random, and maybe a couple other things here and there. Again, 40 minutes long, July 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Additionally, they have added another spotlight in, and that is going to be on July 19th, and it's going to take a look at Madden NFL 2020... 20, 20, 20, uh, Madden NFL 22. Ha, uh, you this had is one. not the new one. <laughs> I didn't update these notes, actually, fam. This one was already scheduled. July 19th, Madden NFL 2022. I can't say that number. All access scouting, and there's also a FIFA one that got added in, I believe, a day or two later. I think it's July 20th. Um, but there will be some kind of FIFA thing coming for its own standalone as well prior to EA Play Live. I don't know what's wrong with me in the number 22. That was weird. I think it's the fact that you put 20 in front of it. It's too many T's. Yeah, 20, there's just, yeah, I don't know what the heck I got going on over here, but uh, we're going to move forward from my number dyslexia that I'm developing here on the show <laughs> and into Minecraft Dungeons, the latest expansion, Echoing Void, which, by the way, I love the name of. And, John, if you want to pull an image up of this as well, I freaking love the color scheme, too. It is going to drop on July 28th, the game's six DLC packs so far. I believe it's been out for like a year now. Uh, it's continuing to drop DLC packs. I love this purplish, bluish, green kind of theme they got going on here uh, that you live listeners are seeing now here on Twitch. Um, I really like this, John. I think it's cool that they keep adding new content. It keeps the game fresh. It continues to extend uh, that end game content in a sense and continuing to add new things in for players. Yeah, I think it looks great. I'm right there with you. When I think void, I think purple and dark colors. I like the addition of green in there as well. I think it looks really good. I have not played Minecraft Dungeons, so I can't really give an accurate feedback. But from what I've seen and read, this one does sound very interesting. Absolutely. Last but not least for upcoming that we're going to mention today is QuakeCon. This is going to run August 19th through the 21st for our friend over there, Nixia, in chat. Uh, in a new announcement post today, they mentioned that live streams will include, and I quote, updates on existing and upcoming games, tournaments, charity fundraising, puppies, giveaways and more we all love the puppies but we also love the idea of upcoming games uh so what does this mean guys i can't tell you the games i really don't know i can tell you i've heard there's a quake reboot in the works 
And this is QuakeCon, so there's a very high possibility that it could be a Quake reboot that's shown here. Uh, there's also rumors of Wolfenstein 3 in the work, so that could be shown here as well. And we just saw Redfall, a CGI trailer at E3. It is set to release in summer slash spring 2022. Uh, with COVID stuff going on, I believe it'll probably be summer. Uh, maybe even push to fall, but they should be ready to so, show some kind of gameplay. So that upcoming games part could be a Quake reboot, could be Wolfenstein 3, could be Redfall, or it could be something we have no idea about. What are you doing? Tying your shoe over there? I had to blow my nose. I didn't want to do that on camera. Uh, I, was, I was trying to be nice to, to our viewers on Twitch. Oh, thank you for blessing us with that. Yeah. That we, we probably would have enjoyed it. Um, Ew, okay, gross. so... <laughs> Quake on August 19th through the 21st. Good old Quakeness, potentially a new game slash a reboot coming out there, but keep an eye out for that. Over to some esports updates before we wrap up today's show. We got some LCS to talk about, Overwatch League, as well as a couple other things. Kicking it off, Fnatic has beat G2 in the Berlin Brawl League of Legends event. Guys, what does this mean? It means they get a nice little trophy and some bragging rights to bring home. I believe Fnatic is now 3-0 and all-time in the Berlin Brawl up against G2. So a nice little win streak there. Hopefully they can translate it to the LEC one day, but we'll have to wait and see on that one. Uh, the NBA 2K League, John, has just entered the turn, their midseason tournament. It kicked off on Wednesday with over $250,000 on the line in its prize pool. How is it going so far, and do you have a bracket to show? I do not have a bracket to show because I didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't know how in-depth we wanted to go on this segment. Uh, yeah, play-ins were yesterday. Uh, there were four, uh, there were four play-in games, uh, so eight teams had to qualify to play in. Uh, WizDG is your number one overall seed. They got they ended up uh, taking on the winner of Gen G versus Celtics crossover, which was Gen G. Spoiler alert: WizDG two owed them. Shocker. Um, but so far, everything's been going according to plan. There haven't been any upsets until 15 minutes ago, Joey. And that is when the 15th seeded Heat Check Gaming took down the number two seeded Pacers Gaming in three. Uh, it blows my freaking mind uh, that the Pacers choked in the first round of the turn tournament. Now, just to give a little explanation here. Uh, it's not just a typical NBA 2K game. Uh, you have archetype bands. Uh, so each position has five archetypes that they can choose from uh, to really help their style of play. Uh, so in game one, there's four bands, two on each side. Game two, another one each. So in total, there's, there's six archetype bands. Game three, there is no additional bands. You just have those. So you can really target one player if you really wanted to. You could target two players if you really wanted to. Uh, you could try to target... Uh, every player, uh, you know, every player um, in maybe one, maybe two uh, per position. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, it's just a very interesting tournament. And it had, it had its first upset. And I think this actually might be the largest upset in the league's history. Granted, it's only four years old. Uh, but a number two seed losing to a number, a number 15 seed is, is absolutely insane. Good feeling about heat check for some reason going into the tournament, but then I saw the bracket and that good feeling started to drip away pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the end, they ended up getting the job done. So a big win over there for heat check. I still think Wizards District Gaming here uh, are probably going to go ahead and take the win. But again, the bans on archetypes definitely make things a bit more interesting than just a straight up regular season matchup. So we'll have to see how it all plays out. Personally, I think with the Pacers being knocked out, it's almost I'm not, not going to say it's guaranteed, but. I think it makes the path to a championship here in the turn even easier for WizDG. Absolutely. Uh, jumping from the NBA 2K League over to the Overwatch League to take a look at their upcoming event, and that is the Star Showdown. They've gone through qualifiers. They are now into the winner's bracket portion. And who do we have left? We have the number one seed from the West, and that is the Dallas Fuel. And they're up against the Chengdu Hunters, the number two seed from the East. And then in matchup two, we have the number two seed from the West, the Atlanta Reign, up against the number one seeded Shanghai Dragons from the East. Uh, looking at a couple of these, John, what do you think we're going to have play out here in this first matchup, Chengdu versus Dallas? I am still waiting for this freaking web page to load so I can put it up on Twitch for everyone. Uh, I have just discovered my computer is updating Windows as we're doing this. Ah, uh, so, so, yes. So, so I, I appreciate Windows. Uh, bamboozling me here on the show. I think Dallas takes it. Uh, Dallas is just such a tough team right now. They're clicking on all cylinders. I think they definitely take that matchup. Yeah, I think Dallas wins this one as well. I, I 
I want to say 3-1, but I want to give the benefit of the doubt to the Chengdu Hunters, so I will go ahead and go 3-2 in the end. 3-1. I would not be surprised if it ends up being 3-1 Dallas Fuel, but I am going to take the Dallas Fuel as well. Over to matchup number two. This one I'm not quite feeling as confident on in favor of the West. This is the Shanghai Dragons up against the Atlanta Reign. John, I will be taking the Shanghai Dragons in this one, and I think I'm going to go 3-1. Okay, I think I got the webpage up here. Uno momento, por favor. We'll get that. How we just became a bilingual podcast. See, si, aquí, el brackets. Uh, let's see, rain against the dragons. Uh, I think Shanghai takes it. Uh, Atlanta's a good team. They're they're starting to to really find their stride. Uh, but uh, I, I feel like Shanghai's been more consistent uh, throughout throughout the season. Uh, Shanghai's definitely not the same season one team that went winless for sure. They definitely had several roster overhauls since then. Uh, Shanghai is a force to be reckoned with. I think Shanghai gets the better of Atlanta in this matchup. And who is going to take it all, John? So we've had Dallas advancing. There are second life chances here and there. Um, but in the end, are you feeling Dallas, Shanghai, Atlanta, or Chengdu to go ahead as the champions of this event? I, I think it's Dallas's to lose, in all honesty. I, I really do. I, I think Dallas is set up for success uh, coming out of the June joust, out of the hero bands. I feel like they, they were able to kind of establish their own meta that worked incredibly well going into the summer showdown. Uh, they played very effectively uh, through the qualifiers, and now that they're in the the knockout rounds for the summer qualifier, I, I think this is really the Fuels tournament to lose. Uh, I, I really don't see a reason for them to drop it. Uh, but again, it, it's, that, it's that same any given Sunday mentality. These are all pro Overwatch League teams for a reason. Uh, they're all pro players for a reason. Anything can happen. Uh, But from what we have seen throughout the year, I have to give the nod to the Dallas Fuel. Yeah, I'll be honest, chat and listeners out there. I have not been the best watcher of the Eastern teams lately with the new schedule. They don't really work out for my schedule as much. So I'm not super up to date on what the meta looks like over there. If it's the same as what we're seeing over here in the East, or I mean the West rather, uh, or if they are changing things up. So I'm a little disconnected from that. With that being said, I have seen Dallas quite a few times. Dallas looks very strong. And they barely beat out our Washington Justice, who is another very, very strong team in the league. So in the end, I will go Dallas as well to repeat after that May showing a little while back. With that, we're going to slide on over to League of Legends to wrap up today's show. First and foremost, the LCS has announced that the 2021 championship will be held with an in-person audience. And this year will be at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey on August 28th through the 29th. Fun little announcement. John and I will be there in site or on site rather in person for the event. So checking that out up there will bring you guys some nice live coverage, some videos and things here and there as well as some tweets and pictures and all that good stuff, uh, as well as be able to talk about it on the podcast later on. So that is the 28th and 29th of August up in Newark, New Jersey for that LCS championship. Yeah, and I really think the only downside uh, to us going, Joey, is the fact that we actually have to go to New Jersey uh, which is quite possibly the worst state in in the history of states, let alone the history of this country. Wow, um, how do you really feel? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 New Jersey, Joey. It's literally the armpit of America, and that's an insult to armpits. Uh, I just uh, they could have picked like cross the river, cross the Hudson, and go and go to New York. Like just do it. I'll I'll pay the fifteen dollars to go into New York City. I don't care. Oh, uh, your price, son. Yeah, that price. I know. Like Madison Square Garden or whatever is going to be so much more expensive uh, than Barclays Center. Center. We'll go to Brooklyn. Why not? I mean, it'll be fun, right? Right? I just, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's New Jersey. That's the only downside. Other than that, I'm really psyched for it. It's, it's, it's going to be hype. I'm pumped. Yeah, it should be a fun event. And before we get there, before we make our way to the LCS Championship, we have to get through week over week of the summer. We're going to kick things off talking about the LEC and giving some updated standings, looking at some predictions for that, and then the LCS before we wrap up today's show. Over in the LEC standings-wise, we have Rogue stealing away in first place right now, tied with Fnatic at 8-3. and three. In third place, it is the Mad Lions roaring their way to the top alongside the Evil Bunnies at Misfits Gaming at 7-4. and four. G2 Esports comes in in your fifth spot with Astralis trailing slightly behind, tied up with Vitality at 5-6. and six. Over into eighth, Excel not quite excelling unless they're trying to get to the bottom of the table. Currently sitting at four and seven. Schalke 04 looking just like their German soccer counterpart. They are looking at relegation here in this franchise league at three and eight. And then SK Gaming at our bottom feeder of the league at two and nine. You, you want to know the best part about the LEC, Joey? Please enlighten me. They don't have to go to New Jersey for their championship. 
Hey, no, they don't. They have to go to Berlin, Germany, most likely. Oh, beautiful. Sorry. It's definitely Kyle not New York. <laughs> God. Gosh, this this Jersey violence is just so deep it's with not you. Not violence is just a fact. I mean, you can't even pump your own gas in that state. Give me a break. Well, not quite factional, but opinional, or I don't even know if that's a word. Uh, what is your opinion on matchup of the week over here in LEC? <laughs> Let me pull the schedule <laughs> up here real quick. Let me get the LEC uh, hot and ready to go here. What a night. I just want to trash New Jersey some more. It is all I really want to do. I swear. Do. Well, let's start trashing some teams over here that are not named Fnatic. Uh, Saturday the 17th, that G2 versus Fnatic rivalry. That's always spicy, especially with Reckless now being oh, over on G2. Oh, that's this week. I'm going to keep bringing that up because it, it, it's a great matchup. Uh, I, I love it. I, I love Reckless. I think he's a great player. He's definitely uh, a fan favorite. He's probably one of my favorite players, if not my uh, the favorite player of mine. Uh, going up against his old team, Fnatic, again, uh, that has to be circled. That, like, that is must-watch League of Legends, in my opinion. Okay, I got one for day one, and it's probably not the one you guys are thinking. It's going to be Misfits and XL. XL has brought in two rookies, a new rookie jungler, as well as support. They've looked really good the last couple weeks. Misfits still looking pretty good overall with a young roster. They have shown a few little bumps here and there. So I actually think this is going to be your day one matchup for this week as far as the best matchup to watch. The second would be Vitality and G2, but to me, Misfits versus Excel should be more exciting. Uh, over to day two, John, I have to agree. I didn't even know it was on the schedule this week. G2 Fnatic takes the cake here on day two, easily the matchup of the week. Over to the LCS, what do our standings look like over here in North America? Go ahead and zoom out for everyone here. Uh, currently in first place because, you know, Cloud9 doesn't like being in first place, apparently. 100 Thieves currently in first, TSM in second place. It's a three-way tie for number three. We're pulling our best European impression here with Evil Geniuses, Cloud9, and Team Liquid all tied in third place. Dignitas in sixth, Immortals in seventh, FlyQuest in eighth. And it's another tie at the bottom of the barrel between Counter Logic Gaming and Golden Guardians. There's... Definitely some counter logic thinking going on down there in the Golden Guardians. Well, they may be more rusty than Golden. Uh, but other than that, Joey, the standings are there. And my Cloud9 is stuck in third place. I'm not happy about that. I forgot that they are averaging the spring and summer wins together on this. Yeah. Because these win-loss records look crazy. I forgot they're putting them all together now. I don't like it. <laughs> hey, it is. It is an experience. Uh, let's talk some matchups of the week, though. So tomorrow, July 16th, is there one that sticks out to you, sir? Pull the schedule back up here. Uh, for the 16th. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Squirkle. <laughs> oh, what a Squirkle. Huh? And who lost to CLG he said, last night? Who lost to CLG last I don't. Week? Someone time him out. Someone, his 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 Golden Guardian propaganda needs to get out of here. Um. Uh, <laughs> now I'm distracted. <laughs> Distraught. Distraught. You know what? Screw it. Let's go ahead and see if CLG can do it against Team Liquid. Fine. Fine. Well, we'll see if it was a fluke. We'll see if it really was Cloud9 or not. We'll see if Team Liquid falls to the CLG trap also with their new mid laner. I, blah. We'll just do that. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that. For day two, I think the matchup to highlight is going to be Team Liquid and 100 Thieves. These are two teams. 100 Thieves in particular has shown a lot of brilliance over the last couple of weeks. Team Liquid looking a little shaky here and there, even after that giant purchase at Valfari, which has gone well in some ways and not so well in others. A little bit of drama around that team, but two teams that should be toward that top three in the league. Now they go head to head here on day two. Over Did to day three, John. Yes. I'm just going to say this right now. Squirkle, you and I are not friends on Sunday. Uh, Golden Guardian C9, it's happening. The the throwdown is real. Uh, yeah, that one. Just because of Squirkle. Simple as that. There you go. Game of the week here at Level Up is going to be <laughs> Golden Guardians up against Cloud9 for a nice little vengeance with chat. Uh, I think one other one to look for on that day is going to be TSM versus Team Liquid as well. TSM and Team Liquid again. Both showing promising results certain games and then not so promising results other games. They should be up there in that top three, top four range, but uh, they've left room to be desired, so that should be a good matchup to watch on that final day as well. 
Hey, sir, I think that just about does it for today. We covered a lot. We kept right to our around 90-minute show that we predicted here. So right on topic, we deleted some topics here and there, and we'll bring some of them back next week as we get a little bit closer to those events. But for now, a lot of good League of Legends to watch, good some Overwatch League action this weekend, the NBA 2K, the Turn Tournament, and a number of gaming shows upcoming next week as well. All right, Nation, that will do it for this edition of Level Up Live. Before you go, head over to patreon.com slash OTN and consider becoming a part of the Overtime Network. In return, you'll get access to exclusive content that nobody else in the world can get unless they are part of OTN Media. If you have not already done so, make sure you follow the show on Twitch to catch next episode of Level Up Live. If you listen to the show on our podcast feed, please do leave us a review. The podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play. We would love to hear from you. In fact, we'd love to hear from our community so much or other ways for you to reach out to us. Joey, what are some of those ways? Absolutely. Level Up Nation, head on over to Twitter and find us at Level Up Live. That is LVLUP Live. In addition to that, you can follow the Umbrella Company, OTN Media, on Twitter and Facebook at OTN Media and on Instagram at OTN underscore media. Last but not least, hit us up with a follow, maybe even a Twitch Prime sub if you're feeling generous over here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv forward slash OTN Media. This show is broadcast Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, make sure you tune in next Thursday, the 22nd of July, as we cover the latest, greatest, and, latest and greatest in gaming and esports news. Words are very difficult today. Do your ears a favor, hit that sub and follow button to know when the next episode of Level Up Live is ready for your listening and viewing pleasures. We will catch you all on Thursday. Have a fantastic weekend. We will see you all next week. Remember, be nice to your fellow gamers online. And as always, level, level up. up.